Welcome to Green Valley Church. I'm so glad that you're here to join us. We're continuing our series, The Best Sermon Ever, which is a reference to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And it's been so exciting to see how uh, this message, uh, really this sermon, uh, applies to every aspect of our lives, no matter what we're facing. So uh, if you're new, uh, I would encourage you to let us know that you've been uh, tracking with us. We'd love to get to know a little bit more about you. Send us a message to info at greenvalleychurch.com. I'm going to pray for our message, and then uh, we're going to join Ryan for worship. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for this time that we have. Thank you for the time uh, that you've placed us in this life and in this world. Pray that you would show us how uh, you are at work in us and around us, and, and show us how you plan to use us to make a difference in this world and in the lives of the people around us. Pray that you would be filling us with your spirit. Pray that you would be speaking through Doug. Lord, uh, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been taught how to talk to you. Hold it together, make the bad look better. Say all the words that I'm supposed to. Bow my head.
Jesus' best sermon ever, he talks about what God rewards. Over the years, I, I think about God's rewards differently. Well, I guess when I was a new believer, I used to think about God's reward was simply getting the girl, getting the grades, getting the goal. As I become a, became a young adult, my, my attitude changed. It was now more about getting the cash, getting the career, getting the car. But I've come to understand that really it has to do with my eternal standing with God forever, as well as my daily walk with Him here. That God's reward has to do with uh, spiritual maturity as well as a life filled with meaning. Well, if that's what God rewards us with, how do we obtain it? Well, again, my ideas about this have changed over the years. When I was a new believer, it was all about keeping God's commandments. I thought I just had to keep a bunch of rules in order to be rewarded. As life went on, I thought, well, maybe it's about great sacrificial service, about these good deeds that I would be commended for, as well as this deep devotion. Should I travel to some far-off mission field, or should I have a charity named after me? Well, fortunately for both of us, Jesus has not left us in the dark when it comes to what God rewards. He's told us plainly in the Sermon on the Mount. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. And we will be looking at this part of his famous sermon. Matthew 6, 1. In this section, Jesus is about to reveal what God rewards. And wouldn't it be great to know? I mean, is it possible that we're expending a lot of effort and energy in vain? What activities, what actions, what attitudes does God command? And this is important because, as I said, this isn't just talking about the rewards in heaven. God also rewards us now with spiritual maturity and a a meaning-filled life. So wouldn't it be great to know what God honors and what He rewards to make sure we're not spinning our wheels? Well, as we get into Matthew chapter 6, Jesus begins by telling us what God doesn't reward. Matthew 6, 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Apparently, according to Jesus, there is no reward, no matter how impressive our actions are or our efforts, when they are done in order to be seen by others. Now, back then, Jesus mentions your acts of righteousness. Back then, the very religious would identify those, those acts of righteousness into three categories. They called them the pillars of piety. And they were charity, prayer, and and fasting. And what Jesus does is he takes each one of those three, charity, prayer, and fasting, and he explains, first of all, what God doesn't reward in those areas and what he does reward. Let's start with what he doesn't reward. Jesus has already mentioned it in verse 1, the overall category, when he talked about practicing your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. So first of all, God does not reward showy service. Again, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, that's the area of charity. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Jesus talks about hypocrites, and the word hypocrites there in the Greek means a play actor. In other words, they're doing their good deeds as if they're on stage in the limelight for the applause of an audience. Jesus says that God doesn't honor that kind of showy service. So how would would we know if we're falling into the trap of showy service? Well, let me identify four indicators. Look again at verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues on the streets, to be honored by others. I'm struck by the word announce. The first indicator of the kind of showy service that God doesn't reward is this. It is announced. For Christmas, uh, I got these uh, set of smart speakers. So now we have these robots that we can talk to in our home. We've, We've got them in three different places in our house. And one of the features is that I can speak to one of them and it will make an announcement all over the entire house. So let's imagine I'm uh, at my computer and I'm writing an online, making an online donation 
to a church or charity. I say, Alexa, announce that I am making a donation. And suddenly the whole house reverberates with it. And let's say just now when I said that online, it triggered your smart speaker in your house to do it as well. And right now all over San Diego County and beyond, there's an announcement being made of this generous donation. By the way, I'd love to hear if I actually triggered Alexa in your home. When I was, when I was looking over this talk this morning, I said that phrase out loud and it actually did trigger that uh, around our home. Anyway, that's the kind of ridiculous exaggeration that Jesus is making here as well. When Jesus talks about announcing it with trumpets, he pictures this huge fanfare, this sort of ridiculous parade, this big show, this huge proclamation. Anytime we are more concerned about what others think of our good deeds rather than the good deeds themselves, it becomes showy service. Next, Jesus moves from the example of charity to the example of prayer, which was the second pillar of piety back then. In verse 5, he says this, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues or on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. The street corners, of course, was where all the traffic was, and, and the goal was to be seen by others. The next indicator of the kind of showy service that God does not reward is that it is spotlighted. Back then, at set times during the day, the Pharisees would stop whatever they're doing, bow down in prayer. Even if they were on the streets, in, in fact, they particularly loved it if they were in a crowded area because it was this pretentious display, look, everyone, I'm praying. They wanted to get the spotlight that everyone knew they were praying. The point is this, anytime we are more concerned about being seen by others than being heard by God, it has become showy service. Next, Jesus covers the third pillar of piety back then, fasting. By the way, we're going to skip over the Lord's Prayer and come back to that, deal with that by itself next week. So skip all the way down to verse 16. Jesus is still on the same theme when he says this in verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. The Pharisees back then would make a big deal about fasting twice a week. And they would pour ashes, ashes on their head to contort their faces. They would look miserable. The third indicator of showy service is when it is complained about. I've discovered this. It's so easy in the Christian life to sort of convey a poor me attitude. I'm trying so hard. I'm so devoted. Like the Pharisees or the hypocrites, we try to look good by looking bad. We convey this, 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 this idea to everyone we meet, oh, I'm so serious about my faith and it's so hard, but I'm devoted. Poor me. Maybe you never thought about it, but one way people try to look good is by looking bad. Haggard, weary, worn out. But the final indicator of showy service is the most surprising. It's not what we'd expect Jesus to say. The final indicator of showy service is this, it is rewarding. At least that's what Jesus says. In each of these three examples, Jesus offers the very same phrase in verse 4, verse 5, and verse 16. And it is this, Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. He doesn't say there's no reward. Instead, he says that the attention they get from others is their reward. But it is also their only reward. Again, Jesus doesn't say showy service is unrewarding. He simply says that God doesn't reward it. Instead, the only only reward we get is from the audience we cultivate. So there you have the indicators of showy service. It is announced, it is spotlighted, sometimes it's complained about, and it is rewarding, but only here on earth. So if that's what God doesn't reward, what does He commend? Well, a closer look at this passage reveals that what God really does reward isn't showy service, but rather secret service. 
God values discretion when it comes to our devotion to Him. He values secret service. Recently, I heard about this guy who won an award in his workplace for uh, being the most secretive person. You could, you could tell him anything. If you confided in him, he would not share it. It was safe with him. When he accepted the reward, he said this, I can't tell you how much this means to me. Of course he did. Well, you might have to think about that one for a second. But God values that our secrets, our service is secret with him. Does that mean that no one would ever know? What about other examples in Scripture where we're supposed to pray with others, lead by example, spur one another on to good deeds, to let our light shine before others? Well, let's look at what Jesus says in these, in these three examples, the principle behind each. First of all, let's talk about charity. Look at Matthew 6, 3 and 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what the right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. What does Jesus mean? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Well, first of all, this is hyperbole. Jesus used this technique often. It's an exaggerated way of saying, do it in secret. But it's more than that. The picture here is, is as a beggar on the street of Jerusalem. Uh, since most people back then were right-handed, he's saying, as you pass by that needy person, just slip some coins to them discreetly with one hand. Rather than making a huge show with two hands, offering it to them, attracting the attention of others. As far as your left hand knows, there's nothing going on over here. And that would be the side that was exposed to the outside world. In other words, it's not that no one would know, certainly the recipient would know, but rather not everyone would know. Because you're not showcasing your generosity, you're showcasing God's goodness. Which leads to the first indicator of the service that God rewards. We care for others in a way that showcases God, not us. Remember, I, I told you earlier in this very same sermon, the best sermon either, ever, Jesus said this. He said in, in verse 12 of chapter 5, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So one place he says, do it secretly. In another place he says, let people see it. Did Jesus change his mind? No. The difference is who is being spotlighted. Jesus encourages us to let our deeds be, be stunned so that others would be in awe of God, not us. The difference is our motivation. It always is. Why are we motivated to do it? Are we doing it so that, that people will be impressed with God or with us? Care for others in a way that showcases God. Well, next look at verse 6. When it comes to the practice of prayer, Jesus says this. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Back when I was in college, there was this broom closet at the end of the hallway of our dorm, and I used to like to slip into there and pray. I, I thought I was fulfilling this, this passage. But the word here for, for room isn't closet. It's actually probably more like the word storeroom. It would have been the only room back in the day that in a household that you could lock. The idea here was to, to get away so that you weren't distracted by others and you could focus on God. So here's the next indicator in secret service. We pray to an audience of one. Don't think about who's listening out there. Think about who's listening up there. I cringe at those times in my life when I, when I catch myself praying and I'm only thinking about others who are listening, what they hear. It's so easy to do. Even if we are praying with people, we should pray to an audience of one. Finally, I love what Jesus says about fasting. In verse 17 and 18, But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. I love that. 
The idea here is instead of putting ashes on your head, put oil in your hair and face. Oil back then would have been uh, a sort of a perfume or, or a, a cosmetic. It would have been something that you would use uh, as, you, as you bathe and as you clean. Jesus is basically saying, how about a little self-care? Don't come across as miserable, but vital. Here's the point. As kingdom people, as we serve the Lord, we should focus on the privilege, not the sacrifice. Don't try to go around looking all gloomy. It's a bad reflection on God, and it puts all the attention on you. Yes, serving the Lord can be hard. Yes, it can be draining and sacrificial and exhausting. But so is so much of life itself. But God has redeemed us from that and invited us into this deep privilege of living for Him and, and with all these, these disciplines and, and, and opportunities around us to make a life that really matters. We should reflect on that even in our sacrifice. So according to Jesus, this is what God rewards when we care in a way that showcases God, when we pray to an audience of one, and when we focus on privilege, not sacrifice. So here's how I'd like to uh, wrap up. I'd like to end by asking you a question. Why is this worth it? The answer comes in the phrase that, that Jesus offers in each one of these examples. At the end of each example, this is how he finishes. When it comes to secret charity, Jesus says in verse 4, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When it comes to secret prayer, Jesus ends with this, verse 6, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when it comes to secret fasting, Jesus concludes this way, verse 18, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Why is it worth it? Because God sees and God rewards. Over the years, this has been such a comfort to me to release my need for others to know because God sees. God knows what's happening. More than that, I can let go of, of my need for human recognition because I know I have God's smile. And I know I have his reward, which is not just in heaven, but also closer walk here on earth, spiritual growth, as well as a meaning-filled life. At least that's what Jesus said in the best sermon ever. So when it comes to what God rewards, why not consider joining his secret service? Would you pray with me? Lord God, I, I thank you so much that no matter where we are, in very private places, very public places, when we're surrounded by people, and even when we're all alone, Lord, you see and you reward. You know what's going on in our hearts. You see our motives. And we have the opportunity, we have the invitation as your kingdom people to live for that, to be motivated by that. So I pray that, Lord, more and more we would sense your smile upon our lives, your reward and your involvement. We would know the, the blessing that comes from living with our eyes upon you, knowing that your eyes are upon us. That we would live not for this world's trinkets, but for your great reward. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. God's best to you from Green Valley Church.